Friction may not seem that important, but without it, our world would nearly come to a halt. We wouldn't be able to write. The lack of friction would keep any ink or graphite from coming off on the page. We wouldn't be able to use matches to start fires, and we surely wouldn't be able to pick them up. But things get much worse from here. We wouldn't be able to walk, but we would also be able to move for very long periods of time over long distances due to the lack of friction slowing us down. If you were able to survive this world for any length of time, you would soon starve. Soil wouldn't be able to adhere together with the loss of friction, which means that the entire global agriculture system would practically crumble. Every building held together with screws or nails would soon fall apart as friction is the main force keeping these fasteners in place. So we couldn't walk, drive, pick anything up, and we would starve within a matter of weeks, and most buildings would probably collapse. Maybe someone could survive all of this. But it gets much, much worse. Meteors. Yes, meteors. They wouldn't burn up in the atmosphere due to the lack of molecular friction, so extinction-causing events would be plausible on the daily. Anything that entered the Earth's atmosphere would almost surely hit the Earth's surface at astronomical speeds. Terminal velocity would be a thing of the past without friction, so objects would continue to accelerate until impact. Knowing this, something as small as a penny could wipe out an entire neighborhood. Probably not, but maybe. NASA has the stones used to create the Egyptian pyramids weighed on average about 2.5 tons each. Research shows workers would move the stones on sleds. However, the friction of wood against dry sand in the desert caused significant drag and would create a sand berm in front of the sled as it moved forward. Workers would then need to clear the buildup of sand before the sled could be moved again. Researchers' new interpretation of an ancient Egyptian painting shows workers may have forged Okay, today we move into uh, chapter 6, which is our second chapter on forces. Let me say first that everything we need to do with regard to forces, the analysis of dynamical problems, has been done in chapter 5. So there is nothing more to learn about forces more than what we did in chapter 5. In chapter 6, we will consider some very specific uh, forces that are important in our uh, daily life and consider them. But there is nothing really new about our analysis of forces. The three special forces that are treated in chapter 6 are frictional forces, centripetal forces that are responsible for centripetal acceleration, and the drag force, which is the force of air resistance, uh, which affects the motion of vehicles like uh, uh, race, race cars, and airplanes. Now, out of these three forces, we will consider two of them. We will consider the frictional force and the centripetal force, but we will not consider the drag force. It's a very important uh, force, very nice to deal with, but that is left for uh, reading from the textbook. So let's start today with the uh, first of these, which is the frictional force. Frictional forces are unavoidable in our daily life. If we were not able to counteract them, they would stop every moving object and bring to a halt every rotating shaft. About 20% of the gasoline used in an automobile is needed to counteract friction in the engine. So the conclusion we get from this is that the frictional force is a very bad force. We want to get rid of it, but that's not always the case. Frictional forces are as bad as they are, are important to keep things moving uh, on uh, surfaces. So, on the other hand, the friction were totally absent, like what happens in uh, winter uh, conditions where the roads are covered with ice, you can see that you cannot control the movement of vehicles at all. Okay, they become uncontrollable because of the lack of friction with the road. So if friction were totally absent, we could not get an automobile to go anywhere. Here in chapter six, we deal with the frictional forces that exist between dry solid surfaces that are either stationary relative to each other or moving across each other at slow speeds. And we will introduce the frictional force through 
three thought experiments. Okay, these are simple experiments, conceptual. We know their results with certainty to the extent that we don't have to do them. Let's look at the first experiment. The first experiment says, send a book sliding across a horizontal table. So let's say that this is a book and this is a horizontal table and you take the book and you send it, give it some kick and send it across a horizontal table. We all know that the book slows down. It will go through some distance, slow down and then stop. This is the observation. Now let us explain this observation in terms of what we have learned in chapters two to five. From our study of kinematics, since the book slows down, it means that the book must have an acceleration that is parallel to the surface in a direction that is opposite to its velocity. That's kinematics. Now let's bring in dynamics. Dynamics, Newton's second law says, if there is acceleration, there must be a force producing that acceleration. So from Newton's second law, a force must act on the book parallel to the table surface in the direction opposite to its velocity. That force is a frictional force. So this is the first experiment, very simple one. If you take a book and slide it across a surface, it will slow down and then stop. Now let us look at the second experiment. In the second experiment, we want to have the same book, but now we want to push it continuously. Okay, keep pushing it so that it moves with constant velocity on the surface. So here, push horizontally on the book to make it travel at constant velocity along the table. And now let us again explain this in terms of uh, kinematics and dynamics. The question now is, can the force from you, the force that you apply, can it be the only horizontal force on the book? And the answer is no, because if it were the only uh, horizontal force, it would produce acceleration of the book. But the book is not accelerating, it is moving with constant velocity. So, because uh, the, the answer is no, the, your force is not the only one, because then the book would accelerate. From Newton's second law, there must be a second force directed opposite to your force, but with the same magnitude, so that the two forces balance, the acceleration is zero, and the book moves with constant velocity. That second force is a frictional force directed parallel to the table. Now, in both of these experiments, there was some motion. Now let's move to experiment three, in which there is no motion. In experiment three, you want to push horizontally on a heavy crate. We have a very heavy crate, and it is sitting on a rough surface, and you want to push it, okay? So you apply a force to do that. You apply the force, but the crate does not move. It, it's too heavy, and you cannot move it. From Newton's second law, although you are applying a force, that force is not moving uh, the crate. So it means that a second force must also be acting on the crate to counteract your force. Moreover, the second force must be directed opposite to your force and have the same magnitude as your force so that the two forces balance. That second force is a frictional force. Now you want to push even harder. Let's look at it in another way. Let's say that we have a lot of identical persons. Each one of them can apply the same amount of force. Let's say each one of them can push with a force of 10 newtons. So you are the first one. You apply a force of 10 newtons and the crate doesn't apply, it doesn't move. So you say that there is a frictional force equal to my force, but in the opposite direction. And therefore, your conclusion is the frictional force by the surface is equal to 10 newtons. And the solution that you can give is to say, okay, this is the frictional force. Let me bring another person. So instead of one, we have two persons. And instead of 10 newtons, 
now we have 20 newtons 20 newtons compared to the 10 frictional force newton we will move uh, the crate but the thing is with your friend with 20 newtons the crate does not move which means that as you increase your applied force the frictional force keep increasing okay so here is the situation apparently the frictional force can change in magnitude so that the two forces the force from you and your friends and the frictional force is still balanced and you keep bringing in more and more people as you increase your force the frictional force will increase until you come to a point where let's say that you bring in 14 people each one gives 140 new, uh, 10 newtons so you have a force a critical force of 140 newtons just as an example when you reach this value the crate starts to slide which means that there is a maximum value of the frictional force and if you exceed that value the crate will start to slide so push with all your strength let's say with the 14 people the crate begins to slide which means that eventually at one point there is a maximum magnitude of the frictional force when you exceed the maximum magnitude the crate slides now let's look at this situation from a uh, three body diagram point of view here is the beginning at the beginning you have the crate sitting on the horizontal surface there are two forces acting on it the gravitational force and the normal force now you come in and apply your force trying to push the crate in this case to the left so you exert the force f this is your force on the block attempting to push it to the left in response to your force a frictional force there it is is directed to the right exactly balancing your force equal in magnitude to your force but in the opposite direction the force fs is called the static frictional force static because the block is not moving and the block does not move as you increase your force the frictional force will increase by the same value so as you increase the magnitude of your force the magnitude of the static frictional force also increases and the block remains at rest that will be the case until you reach the point of breakaway break from what break from the surface so when the applied force reaches a certain magnitude the block breaks away from its intimate contact with the tabletop and accelerates to the left in the direction of the applied force the frictional force that then opposes the motion is called the kinetic frictional force kinetic because now the block is moving and we term it as fk so here is the situation once you exceed the force of maximum static friction the block will move and your force will be more than the force of kinetic friction so there will be a net force there is acceleration usually the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force which acts when there is motion is less than the maximum magnitude of the static frictional force which acts when the when there is no motion so if we go back to this example let's say that you need 140 newtons to start moving the block once the block is moving the force of kinetic friction is always less than this so let's say that it is something like 135 newtons there is a difference of 5 newtons that's a net force and that net force will cause the acceleration of the block if you want the block to move with constant velocity if you want the acceleration to be zero you should reduce your applied force to be equal to the force of kinetic friction and at that point the block will move with constant velocity so the situation is summarized at the end graphically by this figure here is the applied force this is what we apply and this is the frictional force at the beginning when there is no motion here is the static case no motion and here is the kinetic case where there is motion in the static case as you increase your applied force the force of static friction will increase okay you can see a one-to-one -one relationship 
it will increase until you reach this point at which we have the maximum value of the force of static friction. If your force exceeds this value, the block or the object will start to move and while it is in motion, we will have the force of kinetic friction. There it is, which is almost constant. So this summarizes the third situation, the third thought experiment. And with it, we are now in a position to discuss the uh, frictional forces and state or write down their properties. <coughs> so we are now in section 6.1, in which we want to talk about frictional forces. So here is 6.1, and here we will talk about frictional forces, and we will discuss three properties of the frictional force. The first property is what happens in this range. The second property is what happens at this point, which is the critical point, between static and kinetic cases. And the third property is what happens while the object is in motion. So let's look at property one, which is when the object is at rest. Property one. It's a simple conceptual property that says, if the body, if the body does not does not move then the static frictional force the static frictional force which we will represent as fs and the horizontal component let's not say horizontal let's say the component the component of the applied force the component of applied force let's call it F that is parallel to the surface balance that means they have the same magnitude but opposite directions. So for example, if, if, if this is our block, if this is the surface, this is our block, and here is the applied force, okay? That is attempting to pull the block to the right. Where is the, uh, the frictional force? The frictional force will be opposite to that tempted motion. This is Fs. And it is equal to, it is equal to the horizontal component of the applied force. So it is this component, okay, which is, let's say, F cosine theta, that is equal to the force of static friction. That's basically what we are saying here. The horizontal component or the component parallel to the surface, for example, if the surface is an inclined plane, okay, and we have a force, let's say, that is parallel to the ground, this way, and here is, uh, it's trying to push it up, the frictional force will be here, okay? Now, where is the component that will balance the frictional force? You will take your applied force and resolve it into two components, a component that is perpendicular to the surface and a component that is parallel to the surface. It is this component that balances the frictional force. So this is the, uh, the first property. It is what happens while the object is at rest. Now let us bring in the second property, which is what happens at this point when we reach the maximum value of the force of static friction. So here is property number two it says the magnitude the magnitude of the force of static friction has a 
maximum value that is called Fs max and that is given by Fs max is equal to Mus times Fn. Okay, remember that Fn is the normal force due to the object sitting on a surface and the frictional force is also related to the surface. So these two forces are very much related to each other. Fn is the, uh, the normal force on the object and the mu s is a constant that is called the coefficient of static friction. Static friction. It's a constant for a given set of surfaces. Like when you have glass on wood, mu s will have a certain value. When you have glass on paper, it will have a different value. Glass on concrete, a third value. So it depends on what surfaces are moving against each other. And therefore, when the applied, when the horizontal or the component of the applied force parallel to the surface, when that component exceeds this value, the object will start to move. And that will bring us to the third range, which is this range here, in which we have the object in motion. And that is property number three. So let's describe what happens there. Property number three says, <coughs> if the body, if the body moves, there is a force of kinetic friction, and the force of kinetic friction, we call it Fk, is equal to mu k times Fn, and this is constant, okay? Again, it is equal to the normal force multiplied by mu k, where mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. And it is usually the case that mu k is less than mu s. So like we said, there's this drop because uh, that's the drop between the maximum value of static friction and the force of kinetic friction. You apply a certain value of applied force to reach there. And once the object starts to move, it will have a force of kinetic friction. There is a difference between the two that will make the object accelerate. So if you want the object to move with constant velocity, you should reduce the applied force that you use to, to reach here and then make it equal to the force of kinetic friction and the object will move with constant velocity. At the end, let us write down some remarks regarding the frictional forces. The first remark is about the applied force. That's this one here. The applied force is the net force acting on the body, acting on the body. Of course, excluding gravity, normal force, and the frictional forces. All the other forces we love them under the applied force. Second point, logically, as the body presses harder on the surface, the normal force increases, and hence the frictional force, be it static or kinetic, also increases because it is uh, it is um, uh, proportional to the normal force. The third point is about the direction of the frictional force. Well, we don't have a problem with the force of kinetic friction. It is always opposite to the motion. Where the object is moving, the kinetic friction will be opposite to that. The critical one is the force of static friction. 
that's where you really have to think about the direction of uh, the frictional force. And uh, the rule goes like this, the direction of the frictional force is always, is always parallel to the surface, okay? It is parallel to the surface and opposed, opposed to attempted, attempted motion. As I said, in the case of kinetic friction, that's not a problem. It's always opposite to the motion. But in a static friction, look at this word, attempted motion. You ask yourself, if the object were to move, where will it move? In that direction. So the force of static friction will be opposite to that. It will always oppose the tendency of the object to move. So these are the properties of the uh, frictional forces. What we want to do now is to go through problems and examples on frictional forces and see how to deal with them. And we will first start with this exam problem. Okay, this is problem 31 in the exam sheet on chapter 6. A very nice illustrative conceptual problem. The problem says a 12 Newton horizontal force is trying to move a 40 Newton block. We have a block whose weight is equal mg is equal to 40 newtons and we want to move this block with a horizontal 12 newton force the block is initially at rest on a rough horizontal surface the coefficients of static and kinetic friction between the block and the surface are 0.5 this is mu s and 0.4 that's mu k find the frictional force on the block well, the first thing we have to find out is, is the block moving or not? Because if it is not moving, the frictional force will be equal to the applied force. If it is moving, the frictional force is given by this equation. So we have to first find out whether the object is moving or not. How do we answer that? Well, we have to calculate this value here. We have to calculate the maximum value of the force of static friction. Because if our force is more than that, the object is moving and we have a force of kinetic friction. If the applied force is less than that, the object is not moving and the frictional force is equal to the applied force. So let us find out. That's the first quantity we should calculate. And that will tell us the situation. <clears throat> okay, so let's draw the situation, sketch the free body diagram. This is 31 in the exam. Here is the situation we have a block that is resting on a horizontal surface, there is the applied force. There is the frictional force, which we don't know if it is static or kinetic. This is the gravitational force, and that's the normal force. So from here, you can immediately see that there is no acceleration here. So the normal force is equal to the gravitational force, which is equal to 40 newtons. 40 newtons. And therefore, the maximum value, the force of static friction, is mu s times Fn. Mu s is equal to 0.5. So 0.5 multiplied by 40, and that is equal to 20 newtons. If your force is more than 20 newtons, the object will be moving. 
if your force is less than 20 newtons, the object is still at rest. So where is our force? Our force is 12 newtons, which is less than that. F is less than the force, uh, the maximum value of the force of static friction, and therefore there will be no motion in this case. The block will remain at rest, and if it is at rest, we saw the curve, okay? We saw the curve here. If it is at rest, the applied force is equal to the force of static friction. So, if is the force of static friction is equal to the applied force, which is equal to the 12 newtons. Okay, there we have it. The next problem, which is a sample problem from the book, is along the same uh, lines. It's very similar to that, except that we have the force now applied at some angle. So that makes the situation a little bit complicated. Let's look at the sample problem. Sample problem 601. So the difference between the exam problem and the sample problem is that in the exam problem, the force is horizontal, now it makes an angle. And if it makes an angle, it affects the horizontal component and it affects the vertical component which affects the normal force. So let's see what we have here. The problem says, the problem says the figure below shows a force of magnitude 12 newtons, okay, strangely, the same magnitude, applied to an eight kilogram block at a downward angle. So you are pushing the uh, block that way, that's this force, at a downward angle of 30 degrees. The coefficients of friction are the mu s is 0.7 and the mu k is 0.4. Does the block begin to slide or does it remain stationary? Whatever it is, what's the magnitude of the frictional force on the block? So this is the, the question that we should answer based on which we can answer the second one. So to do that, we will draw the free body diagram and then proceed from there. Here is the free body diagram, that's the surface. Here is the block, okay? And we have here the gravitational force, mg, we have the normal force, Fn, the applied force is this way. That's the applied force making an angle of theta below the horizontal. And then we have a frictional force this way, okay? It opposes the motion. This force will try to push it that way, so the frictional force will go opposite to that tendency. Now let's look at the y component of this situation because from there we will get the normal force. If we look at the y component of the forces, apply Newton's second law, MAY is equal to Fn, okay, that's positive, and then we have the gravity negative, and we have, you resolve the force F into two components, okay, A y component and an x component. The y component is negative, so that will be minus f, and this is the component that is all, which is this one here, that is opposite to the angle theta, so it goes with the sine, f sine of theta. We don't have acceleration in the y direction, the object is not uh, jumping up or down, so the normal force is equal to mg plus f sine of theta. Now put the numbers. This is equal to the mass is 8 kilograms times 9.8 plus the applied force is 12 newtons. The angle theta is 30 degrees. Sine of that is one half. So this is equal to 84.4 newtons. That's the normal force. So, right away we can calculate the maximum value of the force of static friction, which is equal to mu s multiplied by Fn. How much is mu s? 0.7. So 0.7 times 84.4, and that will be equal to 59 newtons. 
If the horizontal component of F is more than 59, the block will start to slide. If it is less than that, it will not slide and it will remain at rest. So let us now calculate the horizontal component of F because that's the one that will balance or counteract the frictional force. If H horizontal is equal to F cosine of theta, and that will be equal to 12 times cosine of 30 degrees, and that will be equal to 10.4 newtons. Now compare the two. To start the block moving, you need a force of 59 newtons, but the applied force will give me a horizontal component that is only equal to 10.4 newtons. So again, since the horizontal component of the applied force is less than the maximum value of the force of static friction, there will be no motion. And we have static friction. The force of static friction is equal to FH. That's the answer to this one now. And that is equal to 10.4 newtons. Similar problems, but with different directions of the forces. We will next consider a problem from the textbook, which is similar to these two that we just did, but with an extra vertical force. And that is problem 10 in the textbook. So it is more than the other two. We have a force that makes an angle, and we have an extra vertical force. So that makes more forces to deal with. And the problem says, in this figure, a block of weight, W, experiences two applied forces, each of magnitude W over 2. So we have a, a force of magnitude W over 2 directed at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. It's like when you want to pull it with a rope at that angle. And there is another force pointing downward of magnitude W over 2. Let's say that the, the weight of the block is uh, 100 newtons. You bring a child whose weight is 50 newtons, and you let him sit on the block. That's basically what is happening here. The question says, what coefficient of static friction between the block and the floor puts the block on the verge of sliding? Now let's understand the word verge, on the limit, half, okay? Half at inzilaq. At that point, when we are on the verge of sliding, that means the applied force, whatever it is, will be equal to the force of maximum static friction. So when do we reach that condition for the situation? For what value of mu s will we reach that condition? So let's draw the forces, analyze them, and then find what is the necessary value of mu s. <coughs> The situation now is like this. This is problem 10 from the book. We will start by drawing the free body diagram of the situation. Here is the block. We represent it by a dot. And then show the forces acting on it. We have its weight, gravitational force, W. We have the normal force, F in we have this force of magnitude w over 2 at an angle theta of how much uh, 30 degrees and then we have the force of static friction now nothing is moving so we know that we are in static friction and in addition we have the extra force here which is w over 2 so let's start by looking at the y component because that's where we will get the uh, normal force. Apply Newton's second law, Ay is zero, Ay is zero. So the upward forces will be equal to the downward forces. What do we have upward? We have Fn and we have 
the y component of this force, which will go with sine of theta. So we have f n plus this force w over 2, its y component is sine of theta, is equal to the downward forces, w plus w over 2. Now theta is 30 degrees, as, as shown in the figure. Sine of that is 1 half. So this is w over 4. If n plus w over 4 is equal from here, we have 3w over 2. And therefore, the normal force, you take this to the other side, and this will be 5w, 5w over 4. That's the magnitude of the normal force. Now let's look at the x component of the forces. In the x direction, again, a x is 0, nothing is moving. And f s max, that's the value of friction we want to reach if we are on the verge of sliding. It's equal to mu s multiplied by f n. It is this quantity that we are looking for. A mu s that will bring this condition. So uh, just substitute that here. This is equal to 5 over 4 mu s multiplied by w. If we are on the verge of sliding, what will happen? It means that the horizontal force is equal to this frictional force. Then it will start to move, slide. So if we are on the verge of sliding, the horizontal component of the applied force will be equal to Fs max. Now let's put the numbers. The horizontal component of this force will go with cosine of theta. So the force is W over 2. Cosine of theta. That's equal to this value, which is 5 over 4 mu s multiplied by W. Cancel W. Okay, and you can see that the requested coefficient of static friction is uh, 4 over 10, which is 0 0.4, <clears throat> 0 0.4 times cosine of 30, which is cosine, cosine of theta, which is 30 degrees, and that will be equal to 0 0.346. If the coefficient of static friction is equal to this much, then the block will start to slide in this situation. Next, we will consider some problems involving frictional forces and contact forces, third law force pairs. And the first one we will look at uh, is problem 20. Let's look at the problem. The problem says, in this figure, a box of Sirius of mass 1 kilogram and the box of wheat is Sirius and wheat is are these brands of cereal, okay? It's not a big deal. Just there they are. So we put them together. The problem says in this figure a box of Sirius, mass 1 kilogram, that's the yellow one here, and a box of wheat is, that's the blue one, of mass 3 kilograms, are accelerated across a horizontal surface by a horizontal force. We bring them together but we push on the uh, Sirius, a horizontal force applied to the Sirius box. The magnitude of the friction, so they are where? They are accelerated. Read the words carefully. They are moving, okay, kinetic friction. Uh, the magnitude of the frictional force on the Sirius box is two Newtons, and the magnitude of the frictional force on the Wheaties is 3.5 Newtons. If the magnitude of the applied force is 12 newtons, what's the magnitude of the force on the weight is from the Sirius box? So this is similar to what we did in chapter 5. And if you remember what we did there, the first thing was to find the acceleration. How did we find the acceleration? We treated the two as a unit. And that's what we will do here. Treat them as one block of mass, four kilograms, subject to a force whose magnitude 
is 12 newtons affected by frictional forces which are equal to 2 plus 3.5 5.5 newtons find the acceleration okay so let's draw the free body diagram and find the acceleration from there this is problem 20 from the book so treat the two boxes as one unit of mass capital N. So it will look like this. It has mass capital M. There is the normal force, the gravitational force, the applied force, and the total frictional force. In this case, things were made easier by giving us the frictional forces directly. So we just add them together. And the acceleration is in this direction. So apply Newton's second law, m times a is equal to f minus fk. And therefore the acceleration is f minus fk divided by capital M. Let's put the numbers. The applied force is, is where? 12 Newtons minus the frictional forces, two on one, 3.5 on the other one, the total is 5.5, 5.5, and the total mass is one plus three, four kilograms. That will give us the acceleration of the system, and it will be equal to, the acceleration of the system is equal to 1.625, 1.625, meters per second square. With this now, let's go back and consider the wheat is alone because we want to find the force on the wheat is from the shear use. So now consider the wheat is. Draw its free body diagram. What do we have? We have its gravitational force, mg. We have the normal force, fn. We have the kinetic frictional force. And then we have another force here. The blue one will push this one to the right. That's the force we are looking for. So this is the force on the Wheaties due to the Sirius. That's what we are looking for. And the acceleration is to the right. Now, apply Newton's second law to this situation. M A is equal to F W C minus F K. So F W C is equal to M A plus F K. Now put the things carefully. We are talking about the wheat is. The wheat is has a mass of three kilograms. Okay, so three point zero times 1.625 plus the frictional force on the wheat is. Where is that? The frictional force on the shear use? No, 3.5. So that is what we have here. And that will give us a value of 8.4 Newtons as the force on the wheat is from the shear use. And this is a problem involving uh, frictional forces and contact forces. Let us do some similar uh, problems. This is another problem involving contact forces and uh, frictional forces, but the information is given differently. In this problem, we were given directly the frictional forces, so that made it easier. Now here we are given the coefficients of friction, which makes it more calculation than the previous one. So let's see what we have in this problem. This is problem 26 in the textbook. Which says the following. It says the figure shows three crates B 
being pushed over a concrete floor by a horizontal force of magnitude 425 newtons. The masses of the crates are M1 is 30 kilograms, M2 10 kilograms, and M3 20 kilograms. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the floor and each of the crates is 0.7. That makes it easier. It's the same mu for all of them. So again, we can treat them like one unit, which has the same value for mu k. If mu k were different, then you have to treat them one by one. You cannot treat them like a unit. But this time it is easier because since mu k is the same for all of them, we can consider them to be one unit. So the problem says, what is the magnitude of the force F32, the force on crate 3 from crate 2? How much is that force? And then the problem says, if the crates then slide, so this is one surface. Let's say that there is another surface here of different value from you. If the crates then slide onto a polished floor where the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than 0.7, is the magnitude of F32 more than, less than, or the same as it was when the coefficient was 0.7? So let's first answer the first part and then come to the next part. In this situation, we will again treat them like a unit. So this is 26 from the book. Treat the three crates as a unit because mu k is the same for all of them. So the free body diagram will look like this. Here is the system of capital mass M, which is the total mass. This is the applied force F, and this is the total frictional force. Again, they are pushed, so there is motion here. Here is the normal force, and that is the gravitational force, and the acceleration is this way. So Newton's second law for this situation says M times A is equal to F minus FK, which is equal to F minus MUK times MG. MUK times FN. FN is equal to MG. So the acceleration is you divide by the mass, and that is F over M minus mu k times g. This is our equation number one. And if we put the numbers, this will be the applied force is 425 newtons. Okay. This is the total mass. 30 plus 10 is 40. 40 plus 20 is 60 kilograms. Minus 0.7 times 9.8. And that will be equal to point. 223 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration. Now let's find the requested force, the force on three, the force on three from two. So let's isolate number three. Okay, now consider M3. Draw its free body diagram. Here is M3. There is the gravitational force the normal force, and this is the force F32 that we are looking for. Two will push three to the right. That's what we have here. That's what we are looking for. And we have the frictional force in the opposite direction. So this is FK3, and the acceleration is to the right. Now, write Newton's second law for this. M3 times A is equal to F32 minus FK3, which is F32 is equal to M3A, bring that to the other side, and remember that FK is mu K times FN, so it is mu K, FN is equal to M3G. So take M3 as a common factor, you have A plus M U K multiplied by G. Do we have these? If uh, M3 is 20 kilograms, A is 0.223, mu K is 0.7, so put in all of these, and this is equal to 142 newtons. 
more exactly it is 141.67 which is 142 newtons now let us come to part b part b says if these blocks were to move on a smoother surface with less value of mu what will happen to this force will it remain as 142 increase or decrease let's find out let's look at the equation for this and if you look at the equation for this let's look at what is happening here if you look at that okay let me put it down here f over m take this to that side is equal to a plus m u k multiplied by g which is exactly what we have here so we can rewrite F32 as M3 multiplied by this, which is that, F over M. Do you see any effect of a mu k here? No. F is 425 newtons. This is the total mass, and this is the mass M3. Mu k is nowhere to be seen in there, so the value of F32 F3 will remain at its value no matter what the value of Mu k is. And that's something we said in chapter 5 when we discussed contact forces that the uh, third law of force pairs will remain equal and opposite to each other even if the object is accelerating or going from one surface to another one. So that is a manifestation of that. Next, we will move to uh, problem 23, uh, which is really a combination of horizontal and vertical motion. <clears throat> and let us see what we have here. This is problem 23 which says the following. Okay, let's leave the problem. The problem says we have three blocks. One is moving on a table, the other two are hanging. So the problem says when the three blocks in this figure are released from rest, they accelerate. So kinetic friction, there is motion there. They accelerate with a magnitude of 0.5 meters per second squared. That's the magnitude of the acceleration. Block 1 has mass m, block 2 has mass 2m, and block 3 has mass also 2m. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction between block 2 and the table? So what we have to do here is uh, draw the free body diagram of each one of these blocks, solve the problem simultaneously, and find the value of the mu k. Taking into consideration the value of the acceleration that's given in the problem. So let's do that. Here are the free body diagrams. We start with number one. Okay, number one is like this. There is a tension. We will call it T1. That's the tension in this core. And there is its gravitational force. It has a mass of mg, mass m. <clears throat> and its acceleration is upward. The one on the table, the pink one, will have the following forces. There is the tension, T1, due to the cord on the left. There is another tension due to the one on the right. So let's call that T2, and there is friction. Of course, this is a heavier one. So logically, if we release the system, this will go down, that will go up, and this will move to the right. So the frictional force will be to the left. And there we have the frictional force. This is the gravitational force. It has a mass of 2m. So this is 2mg, the normal force, and the acceleration is there. For the third one, number three, there is its 
gravitational force, it has a mass of 2m, so this is 2mg, and there is the tension on the right chord, which we call T2, and it is accelerating downward. So here are the free body diagrams. Let's now write Newton's second law for each one of them, and then add them, find what we want, the coefficient of kinetic friction. So for number one, Newton's second law says m times a is equal to t1 minus mg. For the one on the table, its mass is 2m, so 2m a is equal to t2 minus t1 minus the force of kinetic friction, which is a mu k, remember that fk is a mu k times mg. For this block, m is 2 capital M, so this will be 2 mu k mg, and that will be our equation number 2. For the third block, I will take positive y to be downward in the direction of acceleration. Its mass is 2m, so 2ma is equal to 2mg minus t2. Add the three equations, 1 plus 2 plus 2, 5, ma, t1 will cancel t1, t2 will cancel t2, what is left? 2mg minus mg is mg, and then I have this, minus 2 mu k mg. So let us cancel the m, 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 and m. And let me take g as a common factor here. So I have 5a, or uh, let me bring this one here, and that one to the other side. Uh, what do we have? What do we have? We have uh, 2 mu k, 2 mu k g is equal to g, okay, be careful, 2 mu k g is equal to g minus 5a. So let's divide by 2g. Mu k g over 2g is 1 half minus 5a over 2g. Okay, this is equal to 1 half minus 5 times 0.5 over 2 times 9.8. And that will give us the coefficient of kinetic friction as equal to 0 0.3 7, 2. Okay, there we have the coefficient of kinetic friction. Finally, we will look at some problems involving friction on inclined planes. And the first problem we have on inclines is this problem from the textbook. So let's see what we have here. Problem 28 says, two blocks are connected over a pulley. So let me pull this out. This is problem 28. There we have it. It says, two blocks are connected over a pulley. The mass of block A is 15 kilograms and the coefficient of kinetic friction between A and the incline is 0.2. Angle theta is 30 degrees. Block A slides down. It's extremely important. We know the direction. We know that it is moving and it is moving down because this could be a very heavy uh, block that will push it up or pull it up. But in this time we are told that A is going down. So we know the direction of the motion. Block A slides down the incline at constant speed. So the acceleration is zero. 
given all of this, the problem says, what is the mass of block B? So we are told that the object is moving, that the system is moving, A is moving downward, and it is moving with constant speed, so the acceleration is zero. Given this, we want to find the value of the mass of block B. As usual, we will start by drawing the three body diagrams. We will start with A, because we know everything about A. So let's start with it. And the three body diagram for A will look like this. Here is block A. Okay. Uh, the gravitational force is there, MAG. The normal force, Fn. We have the tension in the cable. Okay. And then we have the frictional force. Where is the frictional force? The object is going down. That's why it is very important to know the direction. The object is going down, so the frictional force will be opposite to the motion. And that is F K in here. This angle is theta as this one. As usual, we will take this to be our x-axis. That is our y-axis. Now, what do we want out of this? We want the tension because that's the quantity that we will use with block B. So, <clears throat> looking at the y direction of the motion, M, A, Y, M, A, we are talking about block A, is equal to, what do we have? We have the normal force minus the vertical component of gravity, which is next to the angle, so that is M, A, G, cosine of theta, al mujawir lizawiya. There is no motion in that direction, so A, A, Y is zero, and the normal force is equal to M, A, G, cosine of theta. Now let's look at the X direction of the motion. What do we have there? M, A multiplied by A, X is equal to T, uh, where is it moving? It is moving that way. Okay, so uh, we have the horizontal component of gravity, okay, there it is, which is opposite to the angle, so that is MAG sine of theta minus these two, minus T minus FK. There is no acceleration because it is moving with constant speed. So the tension T is equal to, take it to the side, so T is equal to M A G sine of theta minus the frictional force. The frictional force is mu K multiplied by the normal force. Where is the normal force? There it is, multiplied by mu K. So minus mu K into M A G cosine of theta. There we have the tension. Now let's look at block B. Draw the three body diagram of block B. We have the tension T and we have its gravitational force MB multiplied by G. There is no acceleration. So immediately we can say that for block B, M B multiplied by G is equal to the tension, which is all of that, M A G sine of theta uh, minus M U K M A G cosine of theta. We can cancel the G, take M A as a common factor, and therefore the mass of block B is equal to the mass of block A into sine of theta minus mu k cosine of theta. And I think now we have everything. We know the mass of A, 15 kilograms. The angle theta is 30 degrees. The mu k is 0.2. You can substitute, find the mass of B, and if you do so, you will find it to be 4.9, 4.9 kilograms. We will conclude with one more uh, problem on 
friction on inclined planes, and that is problem 17 from the textbook. Problem 17 says, in this figure, a force P acts on a block weighing 45 newtons. That's the weight of the block, mg of the block. The block is initially at rest, okay, it's not moving, so we have to do some thinking, some calculation. It's initially at rest on a plane inclined at an angle theta of 15 degrees to the horizontal. The positive direction of the x-axis is up the plane, so that's the positive x. Between uh, block and plane, the coefficient of static friction is mu s 0.5, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is mu k 0.34. In unit vector notation, taking this to be the axis, in unit vector notation, what is the frictional force on the block from the plane when the force p is minus 5i, so it isn't always in the negative direction, is 5 newtons, when it is 8 newtons, when it is 15 newtons. So this is like the first problems we did with friction. In each case, we have to find what is Fs max. And if the applied force exceeds Fs max, we have motion. If it, if it doesn't, we have static friction. So let's do the general situation first, and then we will substitute the specific numbers. The free body diagram of this situation looks like this. Here is the inclined plane. There is the block. Okay, it has weight W. There is the normal force Fn. There is the applied force P, and here we have the frictional force. It's always opposite to the motion. And we are attempting to move it down, so if we we'll go in the opposite direction. Now, the critical value again to find is F S max, and that is equal to mu S multiplied by the weight, multiplied by cosine of theta. You can see that here, M A Y, if that is x and that is y, MAY is equal to the normal force minus the vertical component of gravity, which is W cosine of theta, exactly like we did here, okay? So there is no motion in the vertical direction. If N is W cosine of theta multiplied by mu S, and that is F S maximum. Can we find how much is this? Yes, immediately. A mu S is 0.5. The weight, 45 Newtons, cosine of 15 degrees. That will be equal to 21.7 Newtons. That is the critical value that we want to watch. Now, if the Horizontal force is more than this, it will move. If it is less, it will remain at rest. But remember now, what will give us horizontal forces? It's the force P plus the horizontal component of the gravitational force. Two horizontal forces here. Compare them to this value. So, in the first uh, one, remember that for all cases, the horizontal force is equal to the applied force plus the horizontal component of gravity, which is W sine of theta. It is this component here that is opposite to the angle theta. So calculate this for each case and compare it to that. Let's look at the first case. The first case, we are told that the force P is five newtons. It's already negative, okay? We already take care of that. So if H 
is equal to 5 newtons plus the weight 45 times sine of 15 degrees. If you put the numbers, you will find that this is 16.6 newtons, which is less than 21.7, so the block would not be moving. What's the uh, question? The question is, what is the frictional force? If H is less than F is max, so no motion, and if there is no motion, the force of static friction is equal to the applied force, the horizontal component of the applied forces, which is 16.6 newtons. Part B will be the same situation. I leave that for you. Let's look at C. In C, the horizontal force is equal to 15 newtons plus 45 sine of 15 degrees. Now, if you put the numbers here, this will be equal to 26.6 newtons, which is more than the, force of, uh, the maximum value of the force of static friction. If H is greater than F is max, so here we have motion, and if we have motion, we are talking the force, we are talking about the force of kinetic friction. How much is the force of kinetic friction? It is equal to mu k multiplied by Fn, which is mu k times W cosine of theta. Put in the numbers and you will find that this is equal to 14.8 newtons as the frictional force in this case. The last problem is a problem from the older edition of the textbook. It is also a problem on inclined plane. Very nice, very tricky, very conceptual problem. I'll leave that for you uh, to look at in case you have the time uh, to do it. That brings us to the end of our discussion on uh, frictional forces. We did them with, in detail, the static and the kinetic frictional forces. And I think we did plenty of problems to explain the ideas and how these forces work. Okay, today we continue our discussion of chapter six. This is our uh, second lecture on this uh, chapter. In the last lecture, we discussed frictional forces, and we saw that there are two types of frictional forces, static friction, which applies when the object is at rest, increases as the applied force increases, reaches a maximum value, which is equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. Once the applied force exceeds this value, the object will start to move. And while in motion, the frictional force is the force of kinetic friction, which is constant, has a value that is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force. The frictional force is parallel to the surface, and it is opposite to the direction of attempted motion. Today we move into the second topic we want to consider in chapter 6, which are centripetal forces that are responsible for the centripetal acceleration. To start our discussion, let's review what we studied about uniform circular motion back in chapter 4. A particle is in uniform circular motion if it travels around a circle or a circular arc at constant speed. Although the speed does not vary, the particle has acceleration because the velocity changes in direction. The figure here shows the relationship between the velocity and acceleration vectors at various stages during uniform circular motion. You can see that both vectors have constant magnitude. The magnitude of each one of them doesn't change, but their directions it change continuously. The velocity is always directed tangent to the circle, 
in the direction of motion. The acceleration is directed radially inward, meaning always pointing toward the center of the circle. The acceleration in this case is called the centripetal acceleration, and its value is equal to v squared divided by r. So this is the kinematics of uniform circular motion that we have studied in uh, chapter four. Now let's look at some examples of the forces that produce uniform circular motion. The first example is where we have a slit, okay, that is moving with constant speed in a circular path of radius r on a horizontal frictionless surface. Now, as always, we draw the free body diagram of the object and identify the centripetal force. The centripetal force is the one that causes centripetal acceleration, and it is the force that points toward the center of the circle. So here is the circle. The free body diagram of the slit is this one. This is the slit. The forces acting on it are the normal force due to the surface, the gravitational force, and the tension in the string. It is this one that is pointing toward the center of the circle. So in this case, the centripetal force is the pull or the tension from the string uh, acting on the slit directed inward along the radial axis. Here is another way to see the situation in three dimensions. In this case, it's only the gravitational force, the normal force is not there. So you really have to tilt the string a little bit up or down to bring a component that balances the uh, gravitational force. This is the example we have seen. Now let's say that uh, the, the, the string is tied right at the center. Let's say that we raise the string up there, okay? We tie it that way. What will happen? This is what will happen, okay? If we tie the string up there, you can see that the string and the ball or the slit are no longer in the same plane. The string is here. The plane of the motion, the circle is here, but the string is there. And as you can see, as the ball or the slit moves, the string moves like this, making a cord. Okay, this is a cord. And therefore, this is called the conical pendulum, which is simple, uh, similar to the slit, but now the, the forces are analyzed differently. This is the conical pendulum. The ball is there, the rotation circle is in this plane. Again, Draw the forces acting on the ball and identify the centripetal force. The forces acting on the ball, here is the ball, there is the gravitational force which is always there, and there is the tension in the string. Now, the gravitational force is perpendicular to the plane, so it has nothing to do with the centripetal acceleration. But the tension can be resolved into a horizontal component which we always which we also call the radial component because it is along the radius, and the vertical component. It is the horizontal or radial component of the tension that points toward the center, and that is the centripetal force in this case. So in this case, the centripetal force is provided by, this is the tension, and that's its horizontal component, is provided by the horizontal or radial component of the tension. Another example is that of a car on a curve. Okay, so when a car moves in a circular arc, when it makes a turn or a curve, it has an acceleration that is directed toward the center of the circle. This is kinematics now. You have something that moves in a circle, so there must be a centripetal associ uh, uh, acceleration associated with it because of the change in the direction of the velocity. Now, in this case, we ask what is the force that produces the centripetal acceleration. Draw the free body diagram. Here is the car. The forces acting on it are the gravitational force and the normal force, and there is a frictional force, okay, that prevents the car from sliding away from the circuit. Here is uh, the car, okay, here is uh, the horizontal rod, and let's say that this is the car. Can I take a real car? Okay, here is the car, okay? And the car wants to make the curve, the circle. So it wants to go this way. It wants to go this way. If frictional force is not there, 
the car will not be able to make the circle. It will slide away that way. Okay? There is a tendency that it will slide that way. To prevent that the tendency, there must be a frictional force. The tendency is that way. The frictional force will be opposite to that tendency. So it will be in that direction. And because of the presence of that frictional force, the car will be able to make the turn. Otherwise, it will slide and fly away from the car. So the frictional force points in that direction. And that is pointing toward the center of the circle. So in this case, the force that is responsible for the centripetal acceleration is the force of static friction. It is a static friction because we don't have sliding. If it were, if it were like this, then that is kinetic friction. But the car is not moving that way, okay? And therefore, it is a force of static friction. So, analyzing the situation, we say, in this example, the centripetal force is a frictional force on the tires from the road, which makes the turn possible. A fourth example is that of a satellite orbiting the Earth. And in this case, the satellite, here is the Earth, and there is the satellite in its orbit. The satellite and its content have an acceleration directed toward the center of the circle. It is going in a circle, so it must have a centripetal acceleration pointing toward the center of the circle, which in this case is the center of Earth. This time, the centripetal force is the gravitational attraction exerted by the Earth and directed radially inward toward the center of the Earth. So, in summary, we have seen many examples of centripetal forces. It could be a tension, it could be friction, it could be the gravitational force, it could be the normal force, as we will see in other examples. With this now, let us say what we know about the centripetal force and how to relate it to the acceleration. Remember again that in chapter four, we have seen that the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. And in uh, chapter five, we introduced uh, Newton's second law, F is equal to MA. So what we want to do now is simply couple these equations together. So this is now section 6.3. <coughs> which is about uniform circular motion, the forces responsible for the centripetal acceleration. So summarizing what we have seen in these examples, we can say that the centripetal force, the centripetal force is given by combining these equations if centripetal is equal to m v squared divided by r. It's a very, very simple equation. That's all you have to do. The trick, the challenge, is to identify the centripetal force. But as we said, the way to do it is to draw the free body diagram, find the force or forces that point toward the center of the circle, and that is the centripetal force. Plug it in here and find whatever quantity you want to find. We have seen that the centripetal force could be any force. It could be friction, tension, gravitation, or the normal force. Now we will look at examples and problems uh, on uh, the centripetal forces. And we will start with this typical, classical example of the centripetal force. This is sample problem 604 in the textbook. The problem says, in a 1901 circus performance, Alu Diavolo, that's the name of the person, introduced the stunt of riding a bicycle in a loop-de-loop. -loop. The, the stunt is very simple. The person comes with uh, riding the cycle, riding the bicycle. He will loop the loop and exit from the other side. That's the stunt, okay? Assume that the loop is a circle of radius, that's the radius of this circle here, a circle of radius 2.7 meters. The question says, what is the least, the minimum speed 
that he can could he could have at the top of the loop to remain in contact with it there. Now let's analyze the situation conceptually. The person will come in. If he comes with slow speed, he may go up a little bit here, but then he will retract his way. He will not be able to loop the loop. If he comes with very high speed, he could reach the top and continue to exit from the other side. So there is a critical value of the speed. If he exceeds that <coughs> critical value, he will, make, he will be able to make uh, the loop. Where is that critical speed? It is at the top point. This is the critical point. If he can pass this point, the rest is straightforward. This is immaterial. You can reach here, but you cannot exit the loop. But if you can reach here and pass this point, then definitely he will be able to continue and complete and exit the loop. So the critical point we want to focus on is this one here. What should be the critical value of the uh, speed at this point that will enable him to complete the loop? And that's what he is looking at here. Assume that the, the loop radius is that much. What is the minimum speed he could have at the top of the loop to remain in contact with it there? That's the key point there, in contact. If he remains in contact, that means the normal force on him is not zero. If he loses contact, then the, no, he, the normal force will be zero. There is no more contact with the surface, and he will fall to the ground. Here is another analog of this situation, but now with a car, okay? Rather than a bicycle, people uh, did it with cars, as you can see in here, and that's, that's a modern version of that one there. So here is our situation. As we said, we will focus on this point and analyze what is going on here there. If we do, this is the free body diagram. Remember that the person is here. The center of the circle is here. So the centripetal acceleration is pointing toward the center, which is downward. The gravitational force is always downward. The normal force is perpendicular to the surface and away from the surface. So it will be perpendicular. At this point, the normal force at this point will be either upward or downward. Which way is it? It is downward because if it is upward, he will penetrate the surface. And that's not the way uh, to go. So the normal force is also downward. And this figure here shows you how the normal force changes in magnitude and direction as the person goes around the circle. So with this now, we have the necessary free body diagram. That's what we will use to analyze the situation. That's the only equation we have, and we will use it to find the critical speed. <clears throat> so this is now sample problem 604. And looking at the free body diagram, you can see that M A is equal to F net. I don't have to put vectors because you can see that all of them are downward, all are in the same direction. So let us now substitute for these. What is A? The centripetal acceleration, V squared over R. M V squared over R. What is F net? The sum of all forces. They are all in the same direction. So it will be mg plus the normal force, okay? We want to find the speed, so let's multiply by r and divide by m. What do we have? v squared is equal to rg plus r over m multiplied by the normal force. And now let's look at this equation. r times g is a constant that doesn't change at all. The radius of the circle, I think is 2.7, that's fixed, g is 9.8. Likewise, r and m are constant. If n, the normal force, is variable, you can see that it varies as the person goes around the circle. So from here, the variable is if n, and therefore you can see that 
V is proportional to the normal force. And that means V is minimum when the normal force is minimum. Okay, they are proportional to each other. What is the minimum, the least value of the normal force? It's zero. That's when the uh, object loses contact with the surface, the normal force becomes zero. So, Fn minimum is equal to zero, and that means the object loses contact with the surface. So from this equation, this one here, the corresponding value of V, V minimum, is equal to, that would be zero, and we have Rg, this is a square, so take the square root, and there you have it. Putting in the value of the uh, radius of the circle, how much is that? 2.7 multiplied by 9.8, take the square root, and you will find that the minimum speed that will enable him to complete the loop is equal to 5.1 meters per second. If his speed is less than 5.1, he will not be able to make it to the top. If it is more than 5.1, he will make it to the top and exit the other side of the loop. A very important thing to note here is that the minimum speed is independent of mass. Okay, you don't see the mass here. It only depends on the radius. So how heavy or how light is the person is immaterial. And that's because we are assuming that the track is frictionless. If it is a rough track, that may be a different conclusion. So this is the uh, first uh, example. And here we have a vertical circle. Let me bring something very important to your attention. And that is in this case, the speed is not constant. So this is not really uniform circular motion because the speed changes as we go on the vertical circle. If it were a horizontal circle, then the speed would be constant. But here, the speed is not the speed, not the velocity. The speed is not constant. In the next example, we will deal with the effect of friction on a car. But let us introduce that with the idea here to understand what is going on with the example that we will see shortly. The idea is the following. A modern race car is designed so that the passing air, the, as you can see here, that's the passing air, is designed so that the passing air pushes down on it. Remember the example of the uh, car which wants to make the curve? We said friction must be there, otherwise it will not be able to make the circuit. The more friction we have, the higher the speed we can go. If you have a race car, you want to increase the speed as much as possible. One way to do it is to increase the friction between the tire, between the tires of the car and the road. And one way to increase the friction is to increase the normal force. That's from the previous lecture. To increase the normal force, you push down on the object. We said, as you press harder, the normal force will increase and the frictional force will increase. So that's the idea here. A modern race car is designed so that the passing air pushes down on it, allowing the car to travel much faster through a flat turn without friction failing. This downward push is called negative lift. Okay, it is negative lift. We can have positive lift like the lift of the wing of an airplane. This one here is a negative lift. So with that in mind, let's read sample problem 605. It says the figure here shows a racing car of mass 600 kilograms as it travels on a flat, okay? This is a flat road, like this one. In the next example, we will see a tilted road. But this time, in this example, it is a flat road. So as it travels on uh, a flat track, in a circular arc of radius 100 meters. Because of the shape of the car and the wings on it, the passing air exerts a negative lift FL downward on the car like we saw before. The coefficient of static friction, again, this is a static friction, 
because the car is not sliding. If it is not sliding, it is static friction. The coefficient of static friction between the tires and the track is 0.75, that is mu s. Assume that the forces on the four tires are identical. If the car is on the verge of sliding, hafat al inzilaq if the car is on the verge of sliding out of the turn when its speed is 28.6 meters per second, what is the magnitude of F turn? <clears throat> so the situation is, <clears throat> uh, engineers made this car and they want now to test it. So they ask the driver to increase the speed. Let the speed be 20 meters per second. Can you make the turn? Yes. Let it be 25. I can make it. Let it be 28. Still I can make it. Let it be 28.5. I can make the turn. 28.6. Now he will start to slide. That means we have reached the maximum value of the static frictional force. It can no longer hold the car and therefore the car will start to uh, slide away and that is the maximum speed we have there. At that instant of time, on the verge of sliding, what is the value of the force exerted by the air? Let's analyze this situation. A, a centripetal force must act on the car. We have something, a car or anything, that is moving on a circle, so it must have a centripetal acceleration. A centripetal acceleration means there is a centripetal force producing that acceleration. So this is simple thinking that applies to anything. A centripetal force must act on the car because the car is moving around a circular orbit, and that force must be directed toward the center of curvature of the arc, and in this case, this is horizontally. What are the forces acting on uh, the car? This is the first step. Draw the free body diagram and see which force points toward the center, okay? The circle is here, and the center is there. The forces acting on the car are its weight, Fg, the normal force due to the road, the negative lift, the push due to the air, and then we have the frictional force that way, because we say that if we leave the car to itself, it will slide away from the circuit. To prevent that tendency, the frictional force must be in the opposite direction. And in this case, you can see that the only horizontal force which points toward the center of the circle is the force of static friction. Okay, it is static friction because the car is not sliding. Now, because the car is on the verge of sliding, it means we have reached the maximum value of the force of static friction, which as we know, is equal to mu s multiplied by Fn. At this condition, now we will analyze the situation and find what we want, which is the force of the negative lift due to the air. After this analysis, it becomes a straightforward matter to find the force of the negative lift. <coughs> so here is the situation. Like we started here, MA is equal to F net. In this case, we are talking about the centripetal acceleration. So MV squared divided by R. The only force that is centripetal is the force of the static friction, V F S. Since we are now at the verge of sliding, it means we have reached the maximum speed, which corresponds to the maximum force of static friction. So M over R V max squared is equal to F S max. And how much is this? This is equal to mu S multiplied by the normal force by definition. Now, what is the normal force? You can look at the uh, free body diagram, the normal force. We don't have acceleration in this direction, so the force is balanced. Fn is equal to the sum of these two. So it will be, uh, let me bring the mu s down here, okay? R mu s is equal to the normal force, which is equal to mg plus the force of negative lift. So, 
the force of negative lift. Take this to this side. Take M as a common factor. <coughs> and that will be V max squared divided by R mu S minus G. Do we have these numbers? The mass of the car, let, let me put the uh, previous one oh boy. The mass of the car is 600 kilograms. The maximum speed is 28.6, there it is. The radius of the track, 100 meters. The coefficient of static friction, 0.75. So we have everything we need here. We plug in the value and you will find that the value of the force of negative lift by the air on the car is 664 newtons. And here we have an example where the centripetal force is the frictional force. In the previous one, it was related to the normal force. Next, we move to uh, problem or sample problem 606, which is also about a car moving on a road, but now a tilted road. So let's see what do we have here. Problem, sample problem 606 says the following. It says, curved portions of highways are always banked. Banked means tilted. So this is a flat road. This is a tilted or banked road. I, I don't know if we can see it this way. That may be better, let me see. Okay, can we see it this way? Okay. This is a flat road, and this is a tilted road. Okay, I hope we can see it this way. Well, you, you got the idea. Flat, tilted, or banked road. So the problem says, curved portions of highways are always banked or tilted to prevent cars from sliding off the highway. When a highway is dry, the frictional force, like we saw in the previous example, the frictional force between the tires and the road surface may be enough to prevent the car from sliding. When the highway is wet, like on a rainy day, the frictional force may be negligible, okay? And banking is then essential. Remember what we want. We have a curved road, and we want cars to be able to take the curve without sliding away. If the road is dry, then the curve or uh, the turn is made possible by the frictional force. But if the road is wet, the frictional force is nowhere there, we have to create the centripetal force that will enable the cars to take the road or to take the, the turn. How do we create the uh, the, the, the center, uh, how do we create the, the centripetal force necessary to make the turn possible? Well, we tilt the road. The idea is this. Here is the normal force, okay? I hope we can see it. This is the normal force, okay? This is when the road is flat. If we tilt the road, I hope I can show it this way, that may be better. Okay, so here is, here is the flat road and the normal force. Remember, that we want the car to go this way. That's the turn. If friction is there, that will be possible. But if the road is wet, friction is not there, we have to create a force that points in that direction, toward the center of the circuit. The way to do it is to tilt the road. Okay, tilt it that way. Now look at the normal force. The normal force will tilt with the road because it is always perpendicular to the surface. But now, what did we do? You can resolve the normal force into two components. One component, <coughs> which is this one, one component, okay, here it is, is normal to the ground, and the other component is the horizontal component or the radial component. It is this one, okay? It is with this one that we need because that is the force that will point toward the center of the circuit. And here we have a centripetal force. So that's what we are saying here, that banking becomes essential to be able to produce a centripetal force 
that points toward the center of the circle that makes the turn possible. So the problem here says figure A represents a car of mass M as it moves at a constant speed of 20 meters per second around a banked circular track of radius 190 meters. So let's say that you are the traffic engineer. You want the cars to drive around the curve at a speed of 20 meters per second, and the radius of the curve is 190 meters. So the question is, at what angle should we bank or tilt the road? So here is the situation uh, from a three-dimensional point of view. There is the normal force. The road is here now. The road is here. The road was flat. Now we tilt it. So we tilt the normal force with it, and then we can resolve it into uh, a vertical component that balances the gravitational force and a horizontal or radial component that points toward the center of the circle, and it is this one that we want to find out now. So to do that, what should be the banking angle theta that will enable the cars to go around this curve with that speed? With this in mind now, let us analyze the normal force, resolve it into vertical and horizontal or radial components. If we do so, this is what we get. For the vertical component, let's look at first the radial component, the radial or the horizontal component. The only force there is the uh, is the uh, the only force there is the radial or horizontal component of the normal force, which in this case is the centripetal force. So that is equal to m v squared over r is equal to the radial component of the normal force, which is that component there, which is the one opposite to sine, uh, so to, to the angle, so that will go with sine. So it will be the normal force multiplied by sine of theta. Along the vertical direction, what do we have? We have the gravitational force, mg, is equal to the vertical component of the normal force, which is next to the angle, so that will go with the cosine, and that will be f n cosine of theta. Let us now divide these two equations, divide this over that. So the m will cancel the m. We have v squared divided by r and then divided by g. That is equal to the normal force will cancel. Sine over cosine is equal to tangent of theta. So the required angle is equal to tangent inverse of v squared divided by rg. We want the speed to be 20 meters per second, right? We want the speed to be 20 meters per second. The radius of the curve is equal to 190 meters. Put them here, take tangent inverse, and you will find that the necessary banking or tilting angle is equal to 12 degrees. If you tilt it by that much, the cars will be able to take the turn without sliding over. We will now conclude with a problem from the book, and that is problem 59 from the textbook. <coughs> the problem says, in this figure, a 1.34 kilogram ball, that's there, is connected by means of two massless strings, each of length L, 1.7 meters, to a vertical rotating rod. So the rod is rotating, and as it rotates, the ball will rotate in a horizontal circuit. The strings are tied to the rod with separation D, 1.7, note the numbers, L, and D are the same. So this is an equilateral triangle. The angles here are 60 degrees, just because of the numbers given. 
The tension in the upper string, the tension here, is 35 newtons. What is the tension in the lower string? Okay, they are different because here is the gravitational force, so this one is closer to the gravitational force, and therefore the tension here will be different from that one. So let's see what we have. Let's do it step by step. First, let's find the tension here. The situation is like this. This is the circuit in which the ball rotates. It has radius r, and this is the free body diagram of the ball. We have the gravitational force, the tension in the upper string, we call it T1, uh, that's 35 newtons, and this is the tension in the lower string, T2, that's what we want to find. So let's first look at the geometry, and then we will look at the dynamics. Like I said, we note that D, this is problem 59 from the book, we note that D is equal to L is equal to 1.7 meters. So this is an equilateral triangle. The angle theta is 60 degrees. Remember that this theta is equal to this one. And all these three angles are 60, so theta is 60 degrees. The radius of the circle, R squared, applying Pythagoras, is L squared minus D over 2 squared, is it? The whole thing is D, so this one here is D over 2, and that is L. Put the numbers, and you will find that R, the radius of the circle, is equal to 1.47 meters, and the angle theta, like we said, an equilateral triangle, is equal to 60 degrees. This is the geometry. Now let us analyze the dynamics here. Remember, we want to find T2. So I will look at the vertical direction. Why? Because that's easy. There is no motion at all in this direction. So the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, it means the upward force, which is T1 cosine of theta, okay? And the Mujawar Lizawiya is the next to the angle, so it goes with the cosine. T1 cosine of theta is equal to T2 cosine of theta plus mg, okay? So, what do we have? We have <clears throat> T1 cosine of theta is equal to T2 cosine of theta uh, plus mg, okay? Now remember that cosine of theta is one half, cosine of theta is one half, so divide by cosine of theta, we have T1 is equal to T2, mg over one half would be plus two mg. Let's put the numbers. T2, the tension, what do we want? We want the tension in the lower string. So let's isolate T2. We want T2, okay? So T2 is equal to T1 minus two mg. T1 is the tension in the upper string, which is 35, minus 2, the mass is 1.34, times 9.8. And that uh, will be equal to 8.7 newtons. That's the tension in the lower string. You can see that it is much less than the 35 newtons in the upper one because as I said, this is closer to gravity, so they assist each other. Part B, what is the magnitude of the net force on the ball? Well, as we said, there is no acceleration in the vertical direction. The only acceleration we have is in the horizontal direction, and that's the centripetal acceleration. So how much is the net force? The net force is the sum of the horizontal or radial forces. We have T1, we are looking at this component here, okay? That's the radial one, and that is opposite to the side. So from T1, we have T1 sine theta, and from T2, we have T2 sine theta. Mg will not affect the radial component. So F net, F net is equal to T1 sine of theta, 
plus T2 sine of theta. Take sine of theta as a common factor, T1 plus T2 sine of theta. And we have this, T1 is equal to 35 newtons. T2, we found it, 8.7, theta is 60 degrees. Put this in here, and you will find that this is 37.9 newtons. That is the net force, which is the centripetal force. Now let's look at the rest of the problem. Part C says, what is the speed of the ball? And part D, what is the direction of F net? Let's do D. D is very simple. What is the direction of F net? It is toward the center of rotation. Part C, what is the speed of the ball? We now bring in the centripetal force. Remember that <coughs> MA is equal to F net, and that is F net. A, in this case, is the centripetal acceleration. That is F net. So the speed is R F net divided by M under the square root. We found R, that's 1.47 meters. We found the net force, that's 37.9 newtons. The mass is 1.34 kilograms. Put them in here and you will find that the speed of uh, the, the ball is 6.45 meters per second. And the direction of the net force is the centripetal force. We can say that it is radially inward toward the center of the circuit. I hope that these examples and problems have illustrated all the ideas that we need to be aware about with regard to the centripetal forces that are uh, responsible for the centripetal acceleration.